Hello, I'm Anne Marie Rogers from Responsible Citizens for Public Safety, and we promote public safety through canine awareness, education, and legislation. And we are here on National Pitbull Victim Awareness Day 2020 to remember, honor, and support all of the victims and survivors of pitbull attacks. And today on the Insider Hour, we will talk about this very serious subject. I want to welcome Mia Johnson of NationalPitbullVictimAwareness.org, a victim support and education website. Hello, Mia. Hi, thanks, Anne-Marie. We appreciate it very much. Absolutely. And I want to give a big welcome to Colleen Lynn of DogsBite.org, a dog bite victims group dedicated to reducing serious dog attacks through research and education. And I know that dogsbite.org research and statistics are used in courtrooms and media reports across the nation. So welcome, Colleen. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, thank you both for being here today. We've got some heavy subjects to tackle. Yeah. Neil, I wanted to ask you some questions as well. I, I understand you're a founding member of the National Pitbull Victim Awareness, and you're Canadian. Can you tell us more about how your group got started? Mm -hmm. um, I think everybody involved in our group uh, has been a victim. Uh, they've either been a victim themselves, or they've had a pet killed, or they've had a child or a family member injured, and they went looking for information to try to find out how such a thing could happen and um, had trouble finding information. So uh, a couple of people in Canada and a couple of people in the States decided that we would put together a group and pull together information from as many websites and Facebook pages as we could. So we've identified about 70 different groups that are involved with this issue. And through our website, people can get in contact with those groups. Um, We've moved a little bit more from prov simply providing uh, information in the last few years to a little bit more of an advocacy role in recent years. Fabulous. So who is the National Pitbull Victim Awareness website and Facebook page intended for? It's definitely intended for victims. Um, we want to provide a supportive role for them, especially on our Facebook page where we don't allow any comments whatsoever that will make victims feel uncomfortable. It's monitored constantly for that kind of thing. And the website is for victims and um, for also providing information for journalists and legislators, we've gone to a great deal of trouble to bring together uh, information about attacks and articles in medical journals about the frequency and the disproportionate damage of pit bull attacks in one place on the website so that uh, people seeking information can have access to it fairly readily. Fantastic. And I know you have maps on your website. How yeah. do you work? Can you tell yeah, us? Yeah, the maps are a big job. We've been doing them for a few years. Um, as soon as Google Maps uh, provided a plug-in for uh, WordPress, we were able to then take every, uh, every, every attack that is um, reported in the media is immediately posted on our Facebook account. From the Facebook account, we take that information and we put it into a map format. So people could go to the website and they can see maps of media reports for the last five years. And they can, um, they can go to their own county, their own town, their own uh, province, and they can look for media reports. So it's a really good feature for people that are searching geographically to find out what else has happened in their state. Wow, what a resource. It's uh, a fantastic resource. It's a absolutely. tremendous amount of work and it's all done exclusively by volunteers. And some of these people put in, you know, untold hours of time making this information available. Sure. And there's also an extensive database on the website. Yes, we um, in the last couple of years, we've taken the information from the maps and we put it into a database format so people can go to our website, they can go to the, the uh, database and um, they can 
use it to search geographic areas uh, by putting in the name of their city, town, province, county. Um, they can also search by search terms. So you can go to the database and you could put in how many attacks by family pit bulls in the last five years. How many attacks in hotels or motels? How many attacks on delivery people or how many attacks on baby strollers or joggers? And as soon as you put in those search terms, then all of the news reports about those kinds of attacks by pit bulls over the last five years will come up in the database. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. Um, it's a good resource. It is, it is. And I know that your website also lists medical articles. So mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, um, we use Google Scholar and we use academic search engines to um, track publications that are done in medical journals. Um, and then we list them on our website. We want journalists uh, to be able to use them to offset the kind of misinformation put out there by pit bull advocates. People can actually go to these medical studies. There's links to every one of them. Some of them are extensive. Some of them have looked at hundreds thousands of pit bull attacks and come up with numbers again on the severity and the frequency. Wonderful. And, and I understand you're all unpaid volunteers. So how much are you able to do for the victims? Um, I, I think we do a lot considering uh, we're not able to help anybody directly. We can't go to court for them. We can't uh, speak to lawyers. We can't give them money, um, but we can talk to them. We talk to them by email and by phone. And if you write to our Facebook page, we will answer you pretty, pretty quickly too. And um, if you live in a certain area, we will uh, direct you to look for reports on our map or the database so you can find out information about your area. In some cases, we will, we're, we're happy to do that work for you. Um, we have done some freedom of information requests to different cities and states. And so sometimes we can give those stats to people, especially if they're approaching their city council. We also have a number of information sheets on our website and people can print those out and take them with them to council meetings or send them, forward them to any of their legislators. Oh, that's great. And you know, you've got that Facebook page and it looks very busy. So <laughs> what kind of things do you post about? Yeah, I, I shouldn't laugh. It's, it's not funny that it's busy because we actually report everything that happens all day long, 24 hours, seven days a week. And there are a lot, a lot of pit bull attacks to report. And we also follow up on them. And so if we hear news about how a court case is gone or how a victim is doing, then we'll post that as well. And we post information from many of the other groups. And we post articles, of course, as soon as we see them. Um, we just try to make it a really robust, um, active place where people can get information, they can talk to each other without any fear of being judged or blamed in any way. As I said earlier, we remove all of those comments immediately so that people feel supported and they can talk about it. It's, it's a terrible, terrible traumatic, traumatic thing to experience a pit bull attack. It's even more devastating if you lose someone um, and we want to be able to provide some kind of comfort zone where people can be honest about their feelings and how they feel and how they're doing, how they're recovering. Um, if they went after any kind of uh, legal uh, repercussions and how that worked out for them. So in generally, yeah, the Facebook page is pretty busy and uh, we hope it helps people. Oh, it absolutely helps people. So thank you, Mia. You do You're welcome work. And again, what a great resource. Thank you. you. want to know how serious a problem this is. So I thank you for being with us today on National Pitbull Victim Awareness Day. We want this information to get out there and we want people to be aware. Okay, talking with Colleen Lynn. Colleen wants to, she's going to give a, a presentation about read specific legislation on different levels. So uh, we could start with city legislation. What's happening in Denver? I know they've had a ban for a long time. Well, in January, uh, a councilman uh, began rushing through a pit bull ban repeal effort uh, to undo Denver's 30 year old ban. Uh, he succeeded and council members passed uh, the legislation. 
And then uh, the, uh, the mayor vetoed it uh, on Valentine's Day. It was a very high pressured situation. Uh, that mayor had never vetoed any legislation previously. Uh, they did not, council did not have enough votes to overturn that. Uh, so based on the idea that this repeal effort was going to be pursued, uh, we obtained three years of bite statistics from Denver, 2017, 2019. Um, and despite being banned, pipples being banned in Denver, uh, pipples were among the top three biting breeds for level three and level four bites. And among level five biters, pipples were the top two breeds. Um, a level five bite is a mauling injury. It's multiple level four bites. A level six bite is death. Okay, so, uh, so evil and pipples have a very small population, uh, presumably in Denver that has banned them for 30 years. Uh, they are still among the top biting breeds. And so based on our evaluation of other jurisdictions that have repealed long-standing pit bull bans, we believe Denver can expect to see a four-fold increase in pit bull bites across all injury categories in just five years' time. Wow. So then the repeal initiative was placed on a November ballot? It was. Uh, here's the language. Uh, shall the voters of the city and county of Denver adopt an ordinance authorizing the city to grant a provisional permit to owners or keepers of a pit bull, provided the owner microchips the animal and complies with additional requirements set by Denver Animal Protection. You know, that's what responsible dog owners already do. They microchip and they register, okay? So the, the new breed uh, restricted ordinance is so deficient, it does not even require mandatory spay neuter of pit bulls. Oh, that's a shame. How do you predict the vote will go? I think it's going to pass easily just based on how uh, the ballot language, you know, what the language says. Oh boy. Well, then it, as in state legislation, what happened during the main legislative season regarding statewide preemption bills? Right. So these preemption bills prohibit local governments from passing uh, breed specific laws. Now, these preemption bills have been around for decades. Uh, they were first used by Big Tobacco to stop local smoking bans. Um, every year, our nonprofit fights these state preemption bills in multiple states. Uh, since January 2012, uh, state legislators have rejected 81% of these bills. And over the last four and a half years, the rejection rate increased to 88%. So in 2020, we beat back two bills in Kentucky and Missouri. Uh, this is the sixth time in Missouri the bill has been defeated. Uh, this is the third time in Kentucky the same bill has been defeated. I mean, these, these bills are predictable and are a revolving door in multiple states. I mean, but it's incredibly important to fight them uh, because they're virtually impossible to repeal. So since the first passage of one of these state preemption laws, uh, 1988, barring local governments from enacting pit bull laws, not a single state has managed to fully repeal one of these laws. Now, what's, I mean, Michigan is the still outstanding state. Where is HB 4, you know, 4035 right now? Well, unfortunately, it just on Tuesday the 13th uh, was passed by the House of Representatives in an 88 to 13 vote, which is shameful. But now it's going to go to the Senate, um, and we'll see what happens there. We're, we have a group that is really fighting this hard, so I can only hope that uh, common sense prevails here. Uh, well, what's happening with the final rule for traveling by air with service animals? On January 22, the U.S. Department of Transportation issued a notice of proposed rulemaking stating that emotional support animals, ESAs, will no longer be considered a service animal while traveling by air. I mean, in one fatal swoop, DOT altered the definition of a service animal to align with the Americans with Disabilities Act and no longer consider ESAs a service animal. I mean, this was a stunning reversal um, from previous DOT positions. You know, eliminating ESAs in the airline cab will greatly reduce uh, the number of fraudulent service dogs flying for free. You know, what was even more stunning at this time is that DOT asked for comments on whether a crowded airplane cabin in flight justifies permitting airlines like Delta to prohibit pit bulls or any other specific breeds. Uh, so my nonprofit submitted a 12 page report during public comments and we addressed the unpredictable aggression of pit bulls, the disproportionate response by pit bulls when they attack, 
and that there is no reliable assessment test. The DOT uh, is stuck on the idea that airlines can perform a reliable assessment uh, test of these animals in an airport by an airlines. You know, that can't get done in a shelter environment with, uh, you know, with professional shelter workers and even animal behaviors. Okay? The predictive value of these assessments, temperament tests are simply too low. Absolutely. Well, do you think the final rule will be issued by the end of the year? Well, we hope so, but the pandemic, uh, it's unknown because of the pandemic. Um, now, if DOT does allow Delta and other airlines to tr restrict certain breeds uh, in airline cabin, it will set a federal precedence uh, in U.S. air travel. Wow. Well, another big one. What's, what's happening with the National Defense Authorization Act? There's a yet another national legis legislative issue. The NDAA specifies the annual budget for the entire Department of Defense. This bill passes every year, and it also sets forth policies for the Department of Defense. Now, the House version of this bill is over 3,000 pages long. Inserted into this year's bill, in both the House and Senate versions, is a mandatory breed neutral policy. This amendment was orchestrated by Pitbull special, special Interest Groups and prohibits military branches from enacting any uh, breed safety policy in military housing. Now, a decade ago, each of the military branches adopted a unified pet policy for military housing that bans dangerous dog breeds, primarily pit bulls, Rottweilers, and wolf dog hybrids. And so today, these uh, pit bull special interest groups are trying to undo these previous laws. Mm -hmm. um, this ever began in 2012. Uh, it, was the first, it was first adopted as a proposal by the American Bar Association when Letty Van Cavage was the chair of the ABA's Animal Law Committee. Uh, Van Cavage, as you are aware, is a top lobbyist for pit bull causes, uh, primarily to draft and lobby for state preemption laws that bar cities from adopting pit bull ordinances. Uh, this ABA uh, proposal was adopted again in 2019 and its language made its way into the NDAA this year. So we will take a look at both of these proposals and I will read the 2019 version. Resolved that the American Bar Association urges Congress and the United States Department of Defense to direct the armed forces and its public private venture housing contractors to enact uniform breed neutral pet policies for families living in military housing in the United States. Notably, it must say United States because 42 countries have national level breed specific laws. Mil military housing in those countries must abide by them. In this portion, uh, we would like to have a round table discussion of some pressing issues. And, and uh, what do you think are some of the most pressing issues here? Some information that would help people to know, like uh, what happens after a pit bull attack? That's a really good, that's a really good question. Um, we get contacted by people every day and there's an assumption in the general public that when you're attacked by a dog, including pit bulls, that um, someone is gonna help you, um, that the laws are on your side and that the person who owns the dog will immediately be found and punished or fined in some way. Um, there's an assumption if the dog does extreme damage uh, that there's going to be some kind of consequences for, for that owner. And uh, what we have found is that that absolutely is not the case. In fact, unless you live in an area where there are very um, detailed and strict bylaws uh, about what happens when a dog bites or mauls or kills, um, then there's really legally not much you can do at all, except possibly go through um, uh, a civil lawyer yourself and try to make a claim. But the point is people don't know that laws have to be on the books in order for any consequences to happen. And this is why the pit bull lobby fights so hard against breed specific legislation. They don't want any bylaws that say there will be any kind of consequences if their dogs attack. 
Isn't that a shame? I, I, it's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, I, th I think the reason is that dog laws, most of them were written some time ago um, when people had pets um, and, you know, you just didn't see this kind of thing happening. I mean, Colleen can certainly attest to the increase in the number of attacks by pit bulls over the last 10 years. Um, in fact, Colleen, I hope you will talk about that because I think this is a fairly, a fairly recent issue. And I don't think that legislation has caught up. That's half of it. And the other half is that any legislation that's formulated is fought tooth and nail by the pit bull lobby. Yes. I mean, one question that oh, what was hard for me to understand, I think is hard for just about all victims, is that police do not treat these amazingly violent maulings um, as a crime. No. Uh, and so, you know, if someone uh, were to hit you with a, with a pipe, that is a crime. Um, but to have limbs torn and, uh, you know, hundreds of days in the hospital, there's, there's simply no crime. It's simply a civil matter. And so I think that that is probably, you know, one of the top questions we get at. Um, so this idea of no consequences, I mean, seriously, no consequences. Um, and... Uh, and there's this whole, uh, you know, idea of, you know, the person who owns the dog is supposed to be responsible for that, right? And so it's a really uh, difficult place to uh, be in and recognize, my God, uh, you know, there is uh, no, no consequences. <laughs> it, it, it's really quite terrible. And in places where there are bylaws, um, they usually have a one bite rule or a, a two or three bite rule. In other words, before there's any consequences, a dog has to have attacked somebody at least once and sometimes many more times than that. Yeah, so that's really something we need to work on is getting more uh, criminal liability mm -hmm. for these dog owners whose dogs rip the, rip the limbs off of people yeah. and, and uh, mutilate other pets. It, it's 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 unconscionable to me that, that nothing happens. These people just walk yeah. away. In virtually every area, it's handled by animal control. And I think it should be a police matter. Agreed, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely true. I in, in, fact, in fact, like in our case, and in many cases I've heard of, um, you could be attacked or your pet attacked. And if you call the police, they want you to call animal control. So, yeah. yeah, that happens. That happens here too. But some states have strict liability, but uh, meaning that the owner of the dog is automatically liable for the damage that the dog causes. However, when it's such a serious attack and people have possibly been dismembered or scalped, and you're talking about years of reconstructive surgeries and all of this kind of thing. Um, Typically, the pit bull owners uh, are uncollectible. Correct. There's no, they, so they really have no repercussions. They don't have homeowner's insurance. Correct. They don't have liability insurance for their dogs because most insurance companies don't cover uh, pit bulls anyway. No. Uh, so the victims are just left with ruinous yes. medical bills. Mm -hmm. So something- There's a lack of insurance. Um, there's a lack of civil recourse um, and there is you know, a horrific lack of criminal recourse. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. You, you're not gonna be aware of that until you step into it and see it yourself. And you'll say, I don't believe this is happening. And yes, yes. it's been happening for many decades too. Yeah, so is it true? It's yeah. a, a really hard, uh, hard thing to see for the first time. And then yeah. to try to explain that to someone how difficult that is. Yeah. Um, like, you know, you see, you, you want to have a society who's taking care of you to some degree, making sure that certain laws are on the books so that there isn't this, you know, uh, this, this sudden hor horrific thing uh, that you're now facing. Uh, I mean, like Mia says, I mean, we, we all had an idea that it would, uh, there would be some type of supportive laws for, for victims. Uh, you know, if you became a victim of a dog attack, and there, there really aren't. Uh, and I, you know, my attorney uh, said to me, uh, and I always remember this, there's just two people you can trust after you've been attacked by a dog. And that is your doctor and your attorney. 
Yeah. And I swear to God, you know, I, I still think that today. And, and that's a sad, uh, that's a sad thing. And, and it's going to be even more so with the pit bull because that gets into the whole pit bull controversy. Well, I just think that that's, that's one of the, one of the biggest problems and why it's, it's being fought by this lobby. You want to talk about the lobby at all? Why, why they, uh, you know, are so against any kind of breed specific legislation, which is not, and I think that's a common misconception. BSL is not always a ban. It is even the, even the starting point, mandatory spay neuter, um, proper containment and having liability insurance. And those are things that responsible dog owners would have anyway, when they know that they have a dog, uh, you know, that's been bred for aggression and, and yeah. bred for violence. So. Definitely. We, we saw this in Quebec. Uh, we traveled to Quebec when the province was uh, planning to do a BSL for the whole province of Quebec, such as that Ontario has. And we spoke to Parliament about this. And uh, the common understanding was that uh, people think that their dogs will be taken away from them. Oh, they're going to come to my house and take my dog and kill my dog, which is utter nonsense. In fact, I don't think I've ever heard of any breed legislation being enacted that doesn't grandfather in existing dogs so that if you currently own a pit bull and they decide to, even if they decide to outright ban them, that you are still grandfathered in. And uh, apparently there are some very, very elderly pit bulls still living in Ontario that were grandfathered in some 15 years ago. Um, but that's making a small joke. Um, but they certainly don't come to your house and drag them out and kill them. And in most cases, breed legislation, as you say, Anne-Marie, uh, simply involves having bylaws around the ownership and leasing, leasing them and where and how they can go in public and possibly safety measures for your own house or property. And I think people need to know that we're not specifically picking on pit bulls just arbitrarily. I mean, you, you have to know that, that when one breed type is responsible for such a disproportionate number of attacks, it's only common sense that you focus on that breed. I mean, we don't have poodle attacks and we don't have beagle attacks. We don't, it, it, uh, pit bulls are the number one canine killer. Which is why Colleen, you're right, absolutely right. Colleen can tell us more about those numbers. Absolutely. Well, um, obviously, in fatal, uh, you know, uh, numbers um, over the past 15 years, the bulls are responsible for 66 percent. 66. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, back during the CDC uh, era of, of researching this, um, pit bulls and Rottweilers pretty much accounted for the overwhelming number. Uh, but now the combination of those two is 76% inflicting fatal attacks. Mm -hmm. um, and if you add in a couple of derivative breeds such as the American Bulldog, um, a couple of Mastiffs, you're gonna get up to 84%. Mm -hmm. Definitely. 84%, uh, just a few dog breeds um, inflicting these attacks. Yeah. Yeah, there's been, I think there's been 34 deaths already this year. Um, and by pit bulls specifically, it, including two children, a, a number of babies, including a child sleeping in his playpen, including two seniors who were sitting in their wheelchairs and were attacked by pit bulls. Mm -hmm. And I think that's 34 out of how many deaths by dogs this year, maybe something like 39 deaths. It's, it's a very, very high percentage. And it, it's not by people who are provoking them. In many cases, it's people waiting at a bus stop, walking down the street, uh, just minding their own business. And, you know, pit bulls come out of a yard. They've been known to come out of cars. In fact, they've been known to jump out of second story buildings to attack dogs going by. So there's um, definitely uh, a disproportionate number of deaths by pit bulls specifically. And that's probably really? true in every single country where these dogs show up, right? It's oh, their attack style, their bite style uh, is why they show up so disproportionately um, in, in the fatal attacks. Mm -hmm. And 53% of all pit bull fatalities are the pit bull killing their own family members. Yeah. Uh, and so it's close, it's almost a 50-50, but it's actually 53%. 
Um, and so these are people, some of these dogs are eight years old, have known the children for eight years. And, uh, you know, no history of aggression. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's a risky business if, you know, these people that are so committed to um, believing their people would, would never do this. Um, yeah. They are the ones most victimized, their families, um, right. themselves right. and their children, and then the grandparents are often victimized by these dogs too. Yeah, oh, it's just tragic. And, yeah. and I, I know that, that all three of us know these people. We, we know hundreds of people. We, we actually know them, many of them personally. We've met many of them, people who have had pit bulls for many years, and then they were suddenly attacked, or families who had pit bulls for many years, and at some advanced age, the dog suddenly attacked a neighbor or a child going by. Oh, I, I know personally, even around here, this, the same kind of stories. And the difference between a pit bull and another type of dog is they give zero warning. Mm -hmm. Most dogs will, will let you know that they're upset. They will, you know, bristle. Their, their posture is different. They might growl first. Yeah. Pit bulls can, you know, be in a play bow and having a nice time and then all of a sudden launch into a deadly attack. They're yeah. really not your average dog. They're not a normal dog. No. I mean, not. they were bred specifically to kill and show, show no warning. It gave them an advantage in the fighting ring, which is makes them different than every other dog. And yes, and any dog can bite, but not yeah. all dogs will kill. Pit bulls no. are the ones that will, will, they just don't let go. Well, so, and it's interesting that we talk about don't let go because when it's a molly, there's multiple bites. So they're regripping and biting, regripping and biting. I mean, it's, right. it's horrific, okay? Yeah. And yeah. so this idea of a, of a single hold on and shake, and yes, they do that, but they're also regripping. And so uh, you know, the, a recent study, uh, West Virginia, uh, 2019, November-ish, um, they are the first study to actually define a molly injury, and that is bites to three or more anatomical locations, uh, usually head, neck included. Um, and so, you know, A, you know, I'm really, it, it's exciting that that's, there's been a, there's now a definition for a mauling injury. There hasn't been mm. in the past. That's true. Um, it is very difficult to look at these dog bite studies um, and, uh, and calling them that. And uh, it was Golinko in 2016 who said, hey, they're biting in multiple anatomical uh, locations. And now we've cut. You know, push it a little bit further. That's what a, this is a mauling event, they called it. And mm -hmm. I thought that that was appropriate. I, it's appropriate to describe the injury. It's appropriate to responders who are going to the scene. Okay. Oh, absolutely. We are going to the scene of a mauling event. It is often multiple people are victims and they've been bitten multiple times. So it's one ambulance per, per, per person. Um, uh, it could be, uh, you know, an ambulance and a life flight two ambulances and a life flight. I mean, that is a different response than a response to a dog bite. Yes. And, um, yeah. you know, I'd love to, you know, know how that community, the responders are dealing with it because yeah. they're much more complex. Um, there's got to be a landing pad for you know, some place to uh, land a life flight and uh, multiple EMS and ambulances. So it's... Uh, it's, we really got to, you know, if, if we could only change the concept of the protocol called dog bite, which again is pretty much was invented by the CDC. I and mean, if the mm -hmm. CDC were ever to say, this is a mauling event and, and define it, it would change many, many things. Everything. Everything. Yeah. It really would. Would. Just yeah, something you've as simple got, as that. You've got clips of victims that have been scalped and uh, just what they go through uh, is, is just horrific. Yeah, it's terrible. And, and you brought up another good point too, is that the number of people that are affected by a pit bull attack, I mean, it's quite enormous. It's something that we talked about in Quebec, the effect that it has on a community and the number of people that it eventually involves. Um, people that taxpayers are, are funding, really. They're funding the first responders, they're funding the hospitals and doctors that are doing the surgeries and receiving these people. They're funding any courts that are dealing with it. They're funding uh, animal services. They're funding the animal pound. 
Um, they're funding, um, in many cases, psychologists or trauma specialists. Um, the list goes on and on. We had identified a huge, a huge radius of people that are affected by even just one attack by a pit bull. And I, I guess ultimately the thing that, that really gets me is the way that these dogs are being promoted as uh, something that desperately needs rescuing. It's, it's a, like a self-perpetuated industry. There's, there's a myth that's been perpetuated that pit bulls are abused and they you know, uh, need saving, they need rescuing, they're treated terribly, they're this, they're that, and that people are doing a good thing by adopting them, they're doing a good thing by giving them a home, that they're family pets, that they are going to recover and turn into wonderful family dogs um, if you would only just adopt them. And that message to me is almost criminal. It, it absolutely is criminal because it's it it these dogs, their behavior is based on their genetics. It has nothing to do with how you raise them or train them. There has never been proof in any of these horrific maulings and fatalities that any of those dogs were mistreated or abused. Right. And you know, we've got all kinds of other breeds that are mistreated and abused, but you don't hear about them killing yeah. people. Yeah. I mean, there's something about the pit bull. The manner of attack. The way it met. Yes, absolutely. The manner of attack and the severity of the injuries inflicted. And, yeah. and I mean, there are just so many, many medical studies that that corroborate that, that talk about pit bulls are associated with higher morbidity rates. The injuries they inflict are so much more severe. I mean, what, we've had almost two dozen studies in the last, uh, what, 10 nine years? Oh, nine years, yeah. All of these studies, all of this agreement, which is a little bit unheard of, and, um, and that's not even sinking in. Um, you know, you mm -hmm. had one single study out um, that points to something dangerous with children, just anything. Um, and that will create new loss, just one. And, and, and it can even be anecdotal. Uh, and so it's very frustrating for me personally, um, you know, to keep on presenting this information and particularly to legislators and just have it roll over them. Like it, it means nothing to them. And uh, I mean, I don't know how much more evidence you can get um, to say there needs to be, uh, you know, doctors need to warn families. That's not a breed specific law, but they can warn families um, uh, about the injuries inflicted by these dogs. Uh, yes. you know, people in shelters, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, could, well, there's a great idea once presented to me is that when you adopt a dog that you should get a one-off sheet on uh, you know, what the dog was bred to do. And um, just some basic safety advice. Now, I don't think that would ever happen in our shelters, um, but, you know, a, a primary problem with a lot of the owners today and people who adopt today is that they do not know the history of this dog breed. No. They, they literally do not know. And, um, and uh, you know, there's a lot done to sort of cover that up. Uh, and then of course they do say, okay, well, they were bred for fighting. Um, then they just promptly ignore that. And so, anyways, again, on the subject matter of medical studies, I don't know. Do, is it going to take fifty? You know, uh, you know, hundred? I, I don't know. Um, it's uh, you would think that we could have you know, made more progress at, at this point. There's just yeah. a tremendous amount After of after all the years of tracking this stuff that you've been doing. Yeah. It, it's definitely discouraging. Um, we know that we're very much. Um, David to Goliath, if we could use that metaphor. Um, we know there are a number of um, pit bull um, promotion groups who earn you know, well over a hundred million a year. And we know from looking at their IRS records, which are online, that they are putting a lot of that money back into marketing pit bulls again. Um, so they're taking in money to say, let's rescue them. And then they're putting it out to say, you know, let's, let's have more pit bulls. 
and it's it's really totally completely out of line i mean where does it stop they're being saved at the bottom of the river but they're being tossed in by the hundreds at the top of the river so i mean there really isn't anything that you know a single family or a single person can do by saving one pit bull it's it's much bigger than that it's very very well funded it's very well funded i mean one of the things we talked about for the brand table was how you know small nonprofits like us are on the defensive right we're trying to stop preemption legislation yeah okay? that's a primary thing but we're pretty much on the defensive all the time now we don't have an organized lobby okay no. um the other side does uh we've got national animal welfare groups you know 300 600 million hsus okay all you know, lobbyists in all 50 states uh, the AVMA, uh, the Veterinary Association. So, you know, they have extremely organized lobbies and, uh, and they're the ones getting through to legislators. Um, I mean, mm. at some point I would hope that uh, the doctor communities or associations would begin to speak out, but I, I don't know uh, because it's a controversial issue, uh, but they're the ones that are, that are fixing uh, these children's faces. Um, and so, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a tough place to be. And we get asked, you know, uh, well, can't you be in Washington, D.C. for this? I'm like, no. <laughs> or can't you hire a um, you know, federal lobbyist? No. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, by all the animal welfare groups working in cohesion, and they do, um, that's a pretty big force to split. It's pretty big. Um, and and the, the, the biggest example of that is the National Defense Authorization Act. And we will see what happens to that. We don't know what's going to happen, um, but that um, certainly took some years to plan out and to get that in. And, yeah. and we'll just see how the uh, how the military responds to it. Yeah, I, I don't think people realize um, how much money is put into objecting to breed legislation um, by these pit bull lobby groups. It's it's really it's really quite uh, uh, shocking how much money is put into it. I mean, people write us and they say, oh, I tried to make a comment on my Facebook page that, you know, pit bulls are, you know, terrible dogs because, you know, they killed my dog and, you know, they don't get sympathy at all. They, they get an avalanche of people that are just saying, oh, pit bulls are wonderful dogs and I have a pit bull and here's a picture of my child sleeping with my pit bull. And they're just completely overwhelmed at that kind of a, a small Facebook level with uh, people advocating for them. And then you try to pass something in a city council and these lobby groups actually send their own lawyers to these council meetings to um, argue against the breed legislation. And they also um, go to the house level and they make sure that these laws can't be passed statewide or they try to. So, you know, they're they're very, very aggressive in, in terms of making sure that no laws are passed. That's something people need to know. It's true. It's true. I just want to say thank you both so very much for joining us today to make people more aware of this issue. And uh, I think it's imperative that people realize uh, that medical doctors are now calling pit bull attacks a public health crisis. So we do have a, a video that was made that you can see all of the quotes uh, from different medical professionals and a list of all of the, the medical studies, um, recent medical studies that, that uh, say that pit bulls are dangerous very dangerous, especially to children, and, you know, avoid them. Mm -hmm.